I just love old classic vehicles. They're just raw and pure. Not a bunch of sensors and computers on here. They're relatively easy to work on, but they are not without their challenges. And Project Prickly Pear here for the last two years, and that's right, I have had it for two years this month. I had to go back and look. It's had plenty of challenges along the way, but we're over the hump because over the last couple weeks, I've done a ton of work to this thing and I think it's finally ready, finally ready to go hit the dirt. And while I would love nothing more than to grab the keys and go head for the mountains and get this thing dirty today, I just can't do it yet. Because first of all, I had to strip out the entire interior. So it's all new and empty back there. Plus I've never outfitted this for an off-road trip. So there's a lot of things that I need to go through and make sure I have before I take this old classic out on the trails because the last thing I wanna do is break down out there and not have the right equipment with me. So I thought I would share with you some of the gear I'm taking, some new stuff and some period correct stuff. I think that'll be fun. Then I will show you some of the mechanical and cosmetic stuff that we've been doing to it recently to get it ready to go hit the trails. The other reason that I can't take off today is because 36 hours from now, I'm meeting up with my good friend Marco and Josh and we're heading out on a multi-day trip and so I need to prep the Jeep Wrangler and the trailer so I can be prepared for them. So, I've got a lot to do today. First things first, I'm gonna do a gear check on this guy. So I have a pretty long list of gear that I'm gonna outfit the Cherokee with, but there are some basics that every off-road vehicle needs to have, and I've talked about it on the channel many times, and I'm not gonna stop talking about it until everybody has one. And that is a good quality fire extinguisher and a first aid kit. Having a good quality fire extinguisher is so important because you never know where you're gonna get maybe some fuel that leaks on a manifold, you're gonna have a wire that shorts out and causes a fire, you need to be able to put that out. For me, I've never had a fire on one of my vehicles, but I have used a fire extinguisher on somebody else's vehicle. So having this in a good place where you can easily access it is super important. And then a good quality first aid kit. And look, there's lots of first aid kits out on the market. The best first aid kit that you can have is one that you know what's inside and know how to use it and you've got some basic first aid skills. So go take a class, freshen up on your first aid skills and have both of these readily accessible. And for me in this Jeep for now, I think I'm just gonna put them behind the front seat. Now, before I show you the rest of the essential gear that I'm gonna load up in the Jeep and this cool vintage gear that I've kind of been hoarding over the last couple of years, let me show you what I did to the interior of the Jeep. It was a lot of work, but I think it was totally worth it. The one decision I was having a hard time with this old Cherokee was whether or not to keep these old seats. The front ones have been recovered at some point, but there are just too many shades of green going on inside this Jeep. So the aesthetics are a bit off. Plus they are not very comfortable and there is no headrest. So I opted to buy some new seats that it should be more comfortable and safer if I ever get rear-ended. I did have to drill some new holes in the seats to make them fit with the original mounts, but it's pretty straightforward. I do intend to give these seat mounts a good refresh, but for now, I just want them to work. If I pause and try to make everything perfect as I go along, I'll never get this old Jeep finished. This isn't a restoration project. I just want this to be functional and I can sort the small details out down the road. Next up is a project I've really been procrastinating with and that's removing the headliner and carpet. I knew going in this was going to be a messy job as the old cardboard headliner was warped, falling apart, and it was obviously had some water damage and there was some moisture that had caused some rust on the roof. So anytime I'm driving down the road, I get rained on with little bits of carpet and rust. It's gonna be nice to say goodbye to this. The new headliner is fully ready to go out of the box and is cloth with a foam backing. I spent a good amount of time cleaning the surface rust off the inside of the roof and this was not a fun process and very messy. I did clean the roof as best as possible and applied a coat of rust stop paint on the underside. The best way to have done this would have been to tape everything off and really just get the entire roof but again this is not a concourse restoration project. 
While the paint was drying, I started removing the old vinyl from the rear and the carpet. The vinyl was the original, I'm pretty sure, and it was in bad shape, but I think this carpet has been replaced recently. But again, it's a different shade of green than everything else on the inside of the Jeep. There was a lot of cleanup involved, and this was a messy part. It was at least now over, and time to start installing the new stuff. The carpet is pre-molded and only required a little bit of trimming. And the hardest part is making the holes for the new seats and the seat belt. There might be an easier way to do this, but I found that using a soldering iron to kind of burn the holes for where the seat bolts go through works pretty well. I did install a new piece of fitted vinyl to the rear and added some sound deadening underneath that, along with some sound deadening on the roof. So hopefully this will help with heat in the summer and make things a little quieter when I'm cruising down the trail. Now for the headliner. There were no instructions with this and this is really not a one person job, but here goes. Yep, I fiddled around with this quite a bit. A little bit of trial and error, but eventually I got it into place. This is a two-piece headliner and thankfully the rear installed just a little bit easier than the front. There is still more work to be done on the interior, but these were some big projects I wanted to get sorted before I hit the trail and I think it turned out great. All right, with that out of the way, let's get back to talking about what gear I need to load up in here. The first piece of gear I need to add sounds pretty basic, but I need a home for my spare tire. The spare tire was originally mounted under the rear tailgate, but the previous owner installed an auxiliary fuel tank back there, which was all gummed up and rusted out, and I have since removed, also dropping about 80 pounds of steel weight, by the way. There was a makeshift tire mount inside, but it wouldn't fit a 32 inch tire, plus it rattled like crazy, and so I've removed that as well. So, the spare tire for now is gonna have to sit in the back. I'll see if I can retrofit something underneath in the future. The good news is, with the back seats removed, I've got plenty of room back here. The next essential piece of gear every off-road vehicle should carry is a good toolkit, but especially an older vehicle where you know repairs are inevitable. Having the right tools is critical. I have a full video of what I carry in my tool bag and I will leave a link down below if you're interested. But as I'm going through this, I'm realizing I need to make some changes to this tool bag because most of my sockets and wrenches are metric and I need standard for this old Jeep. I use my toolkit in my other Jeep quite frequently, but something tells me this one is going to get even more use. Another important piece of gear is a good recovery kit. There are lots of options out there to choose from, but just having some basics is important, like a toe strap, a couple shackles, a tree strap, and a snatch block are all good to have on hand. I don't have a winch on this Jeep, and I'm still undecided if it's something I will add, but having some good gear that I can use to tow someone else out or they can tow me with is important to have on hand. Now, originally this old Jeep would have come with this massive old school jack, but I'm gonna carry a bottle jack instead, along with a tire repair kit, and I'm gonna throw a voltage meter in this case because this Jeep is riddled with electrical gremlins which also means the battery's probably gonna die from time to time and I need a way to jumpstart it. And so I have this pretty stout battery pack. And this, these work well. There are lots of them on the market. This has just been one I've used for a couple of years and I have no complaints. All this stuff for now will fit nicely behind the passenger seat. I'm also putting together a special kit with just spare parts for this old Jeep. And right now I only have a U-joint and a couple hoses, but I've got more stuff on order that I will be tucking away on this box once they arrive. I also need a way to inflate my tires if I get a flat or if I'm airing down on the trail and need to air up at the end of the day. And I've had this ARB kit for a while, but it's actually a bit much for these 32 inch tires. So I'm probably gonna get something smaller down the road and maybe even find a way to discreetly hard mount it. Lastly, you never wanna go anywhere without a good knife. And this one is special since I had the pleasure of helping forge the blade. And then my good friend Jordan from Lost Sasquatch Survival turned it into this beauty. It just seems fitting to have its home here in the Jeep, and I'm just not sure where I want to mount it, but I will find a special place for it in here, I think. 
So as I'm adding all this gear to the back of the Jeep, I'm quickly realizing that I don't have a way to tie this stuff down because the last thing I want is when I'm off-road to have all this gear just flopping around, I need to make sure it's good and secure. And so I'm gonna need to figure out a way to add some tie down points in the back of the Jeep. And that might mean drilling some holes in the floor, but I gotta think about that just a little bit more because that stuff's gotta be secured. Now, before I show you the cool vintage camping gear that I've got, I wanna invite you guys to check us out over at trailrecon.com. We've got all kinds of gear over there to outfit your vehicle and your camping experience. Just tons of adventure gear. Plus we've got all kinds of blog write-ups and great information I think you guys will enjoy. So check us out over at trailrecon.com. All right, I'm gonna show you this gear right here and then I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the work that I've done and I've saved the coolest thing we've done to the Cherokee for last. The one thing that I've been on a hunt for ever since I bought this old Jeep is some period correct camping gear like this old Coleman cooler. Finding vintage camping gear that's still in good condition is not easy and to be honest it's not very budget friendly. It would be much easier and definitely more practical to buy a modern new LED light versus this beautiful old vintage Coleman lantern. But it wouldn't be half as cool. These old lanterns will last forever if you take good care of them. This stove is from 1958 and it's never been used. You may have seen me fail to get this lit in an older video, but I have since found some old spare parts and it works great now and I'm looking forward to cooking on it soon. I also picked up a couple of these military mess kits that come with a little pan, some utensils, and some small plates. Kind of a cool little vintage piece. I also found this little brown jug for carrying water and it comes with its own cup and it's actually pretty clean inside. The only challenge is I noticed today that it has a little leak so that's something that needs to get sorted. Next is something I'm extremely excited about and this is something that was sent to me by some followers on the channel here and I am so appreciative of their generosity. This is a Coleman Camp Kitchen, and to the best I can tell, this has never been used. It still has some of the original plastic protection on it. There are no signs of any use, and the checkers and backgammon pieces are still in the original wrapper. While this might be a bit bulky, it's one of my favorite pieces of vintage gear that I'll be carrying when this Cherokee goes out camping. I've still got a few other pieces of vintage gear that I'm on the hunt for, but hopefully I'll find those soon. Now, let's talk about some of the incredible work that's been done with this. One of the first things I did was recently swap out the old alternator because the original one was barely pushing out 13 volts and a new fresh one was in order. This was a relatively easy process, but because the Cherokee has air conditioning, things were a little tight, but with a little persuasion, the new one was installed and it works perfectly. Next, some of you may remember that the exhaust on this Cherokee was a total hack job and it looked horrible. Plus, the exhaust tips exited right in front of the rear tire, which is not ideal for an off-road vehicle. The sound was not pleasant for what a V8 should sound like, and I'd come to find out while we were here at Magnaflow that there were some serious restrictions going on in this exhaust system. My good friends at Magnaflow offered to help me get this sorted and I learned several things as they ripped out the old one and began fabricating a new one. This is going to be so good. Guys, I am super excited because Project Prickly Pear is getting ready to go under the knife where we're going to do a whole bunch of work on it. Now, to start, we just got it back from Shift Auto Works where they rebuilt the transmission, rebuilt the transfer case, and we put brand new 1310 drive shafts front and rear. And I drove it here to Magnaflow for the very first time. It's kind of the longest drive I've done and it runs so good down the road. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna make it sound a little bit better. There's a lot going on with kind of the hack job they did on this exhaust. And so the guys here are gonna do something a little custom, but before we rip it out, I wanna kind of get their impressions on what this actually kind of looks like. Rich, buddy, I, I, I can't tell you how happy I am to have this thing in here, man. It is coming along so well. I'm a little excited to say the least because we do a lot of late model vehicles. Yeah. Uh, I got started in this whole business under underneath this, classic cars which literally are dusty, dirty, rusty, seized, who knows what somebody <laughs> yeah. else put in them. So they're kind of the more exciting of the bunch, so I'm really happy to see Prickly Pear here 
and we can kind of give her that modern touch. Yeah, so there is obviously a kind of a hack job exhaust going on because they originally had a fuel tank, a secondary fuel tank in the rear. And so I think what they thought they were doing was adding more clearance and they probably thought it was adding a little more horsepower, but I'd like to get your first impressions about this and then kind of what we're gonna do that's gonna be completely different. Well, they did a necessity build and you can kind of tell they were doing that for just what you had said. They're trying to get the exhaust out of the way, mm -hmm. which, you know, it takes a lot more fab time. Yep. Uh, we have the tools that a typical muffler shop doesn't have. So uh, they did a great job of just getting it out of the way, but now we want to really optimize it and get it back to kind of being where it needs to be because Looking around, we've got uh, broken hangers, got a couple of fixes with some uh, like uh, mechanics wire. Uh, oh yeah, there's some coat hangers going on <laughs> that are holding this up. It rattles pretty good. <laughs> uh, and then a lot of impingements. I know we've talked a lot about you know exhaust flow being really what we key into, and we want to make sure that the engine breathes correctly. But like looking at the passenger side, you'll see to clear the frame rail. Not only did they have a crush bend, but they had to further the bend using a torch and really constricted the pipe on yeah. one half the engine. And if the system was like a wide pipe that had a crossover that could help balance some of those pressures it wouldn't be as detrimental but here you're literally having one bank of four cylinders trying to push through an area that looks like it's probably only about half the overall diameter that the other side's pushing through. Yeah, I'll bet in the 70s or 80s or whenever they did this that they probably thought, oh, this is gonna sound good and it's gonna have more horsepower because it's gonna be free flowing, but that's not actually the case. Yeah, a, a true duel in this case with something that doesn't have a crossover, you're not taking advantage of the crosstalk that happens or the scavenging that happens when you have each of the cylinders firing through a collector. Yeah. And that's why we use, you know, today we use X pipes, H pipes, and that's a lot of the reasons why a lot of vehicles still use a Y pipe when they have clearance issues and they can't go down both sides is that second collector point allows the negative pulses from one side of the engine that are firing 180 out to really get back to that other cylinder to help pull that exhaust through and that's all called scavenging. And we wanna to try to build some of that back into it. Right on. Well, look, my goal is to one, uh, get this garbage out of here, <laughs> two, make it look cleaner, uh, three, I I'm not trying to be a rock crawler with this thing. I right. want it to really sound really nice, uh, look good, and then you were mentioning we could even put like a cat in here, yeah? Yeah, so some of the vehicles, uh, I know there's uh, a lot of, uh, you want to call it, uh, negative impressions about what a cat does, but in the case of you know driving and trying to be comfortable, the early vehicles, I mean, we're talking most vehicles had sub 10 mile per gallon, so they're pumping a lot of hydrocarbons or fuel smell out. And if you really don't wanna to have to change clothes after a long outing before you go to sleep and all you smell like is saturated fuel, uh, we can put in what's uh, basically a cat that will help remove some of that that's not gonna be a restriction. And uh, being this is a pre-emissions vehicle, we really don't have to put anything in right. it, but I just wanna improve the overall driving experience so that when you guys are on the trail, it's enjoyable for everybody in the car. Yeah, yeah including my wife, so yeah. that's cool. Well, awesome, dude. I'm ready to get started and, uh, and say goodbye to this old stuff. Yeah, it should come out pretty quick. It looks like you know whoever did the, the original job at least made it serviceable. Right. I think it's safe to say I am not sad to see this exhaust go at all. And I am thankful that Magnaflow is lending me a hand here because not having a lift at the house would mean I would be doing this on my back in the garage. Plus, the fabrication that's gonna go into putting the new one in takes a skilled technician. Skills that I don't really have, let's be honest. After the old system was out, and I got a good hard look at really what we were getting rid of, I saw that they had removed this valve that was in line of the exhaust system, and I wanted to ask Rich more about it and see if it was something we needed. Rich, this looks like some kind of like old school cutout, but that's not what this is. What is this guy? So what we're looking at here, this was a part of early technology and getting these motors warm and hot running so they had a stable idle, and it's called a heat riser valve. And as you can see, this one uh, has had some better days. The yep. spring is outside of it. And basically how it worked was, is when exhaust pressure came down at more throttle position and had a counterweight, and it would just push itself open. And actually, well, I just found out, it's not even connected anymore. Oh, so wow. one of the tough parts about these and a lot of early vehicles is they jam up, causing one side of the engine to run very inefficiently as a plug. So probably won't be putting this back in. Yeah, no, no, let's not do that. <laughs> Another conversation I was having with Rich was just exactly how different is this muffler that we're taking out compared to the one we're gonna be putting in. So he decided to do what any normal person would do, ran it over to the bandsaw and cut it open. I love Rich, he's totally my kind of guy. All right, Rich, uh, this is incredibly fascinating. You just cut open this muffler and wow, this does not look efficient. No, this is completely about sound suppression, which is the case with most of these like OE type replacement mufflers. Here you're looking at 
you can see multiple chambers, multiple pathways, but none of them that leads efficiently from one end to the other. And even a very small muffler like this, you can see if you were to kind of look at what that structure is inside, you've got a chamber here, you've got a chamber here, and this is the inlet side. So you've got a pipe that travels all the way through and into this chamber and then opens up. So the gases come in here and they can go whatever direction they need to go. There is a center pipe, which is in the middle here, which is not connected. So this pipe is your outlet pipe and none of this gas can come through. It's going around and over this, out through this hole. And if you look at that hole, that's just a, a port on this side and it's going into this whole middle chamber and it's gotta go from here into this pipe that goes here. So it's kicking intercede into the little louvers in here, but the majority of that has gotta go all the way back into that other port at the very bottom. And that port here is what allows the most amount of airflow to go back this way. So you're looking at here a three pass muffler. So even in this very small place, the air direction is doing this. And that's why it's so restrictive and where all the sound suppression happens. So that might make for a very quiet exhaust, but three passes through that muffler is not efficient. Unlike the straight through pass we're gonna have, but I'm still gonna have the option to kind of mess around with how it sounds. Things are progressing along, but there is a lot of back and forth as they're trying to fit this up. You gotta kind of measure, you gotta tack weld, you gotta adjust the fitting. So there's a lot of work in this custom exhaust that's gonna go in there, but man, this is gonna be so nice. Now, Rich and I were talking about what muffler we wanna put in this, and obviously I want something that's high flow. And you may have seen us talk about this before, but this is the Magnaflow High Flow X Mod Series exhaust muffler with the NDT technology, the no drone technology. And we have something very similar in in the JK, which is the Overland series. And what this is gonna allow us to do is customize the tone. And so if I'm going to Cars and Coffee, you know, I can make this a little louder, but if we're gonna go on a long drive across a couple states, you know, we can use the J-pipe, we can use the resonator, and kind of quiet things down a little bit. So this is gonna be a very nice option. I'm excited to see what this looks like and to see what it sounds like. The next thing I needed to decide was whether or not I wanted to add a catalytic converter to the system. I think there are some myths that folks don't really understand about catalytic converters and I opted to add it to my system and I asked Rich to explain why this is a good option. So I was talking to Brad a little bit about the tech and of course uh, we wanted to dive a little deeper and one of the interesting things about the specific cat I chose was that it's a metallic cat and I did mention that before but what that means is that it's got a metallic substrate. Most people know that the cat inside has got a ceramic material. That material is subject to a very tight range of temperatures it has to operate in, insofar that most of the fuel injected cars, they use the O2 sensors fore and aft to determine whether the cat's starting to over temp or melt down that ceramic, and it'll adjust the computer's uh, ignition cycle and also the fueling cycle to put extra fuel in off of the ignition cycle to make sure that it cools the cat down. Oftentimes it's called a cat over temp feature. We don't have that luxury in this vehicle. It's not a fuel injected vehicle. So I'm using a metallic substrate that can withstand higher temperatures and greater variability without coming apart internally. So this should be absolutely no detriment to the car while making sure it's a little bit cleaner to smell. So I don't need to have a catalytic converter on my Jeep, but for the reasons Rich mentioned, that's why I'm opting to have one on. By now, the exhaust system is really starting to come together, and Rich even jumped in and started welding some of the pipes together. He really is a jack of all trades. I mentioned that at the start of the year, one of my New Year's resolutions is to teach myself to weld. It's something I've been wanting to do for a long time. And you know what? This has inspired me. I need to quit procrastinating and get hot and teach myself to weld. Coming soon. So Rich, not only are you the master of marketing for Magnaflow, but you can weld, dude. It's pretty cool. So the whole front section is pretty much roughed out. Yeah, this is basically like what we would use as a prototype. Obviously, we wouldn't have all these segments put into it for a finished product, but for the sake of getting it fitted on the vehicle, we'd use this, analyze this, go through the scanning process, and bend it out. 
Uh, but for the most part, this is similar to a process that a customer, if they were trying to do this themselves, they'd buy one of our custom builder kits and you can kind of pick the diameter. So we have two and a quarter, two and a half, three. So like this front one, you get the front kit, you have all these bends here, and then you just kind of piece them together. And hopefully we have the right parts in our uh, catalog. We have like uh, different Y pipes, we have different collectors based upon what the fitment is, sizes, orientations, all that stuff. We try to put it all there so you can do this yourself if you've got a little welding skill. Yeah, so somebody uh, enjoys doing a little bit of puzzle work, yep. they, can, uh, they can do this in a, a day or two, probably. Yeah, and just piecing it together is a matter of cutting it and then just kind of getting the two parts to kind of fit together. But given that you have enough parts, you really, there's anything you could do. I mean, if you really want tight clearance, you want to go quick and easy, yeah. it's really up to how much time you want to put in it. Well, so much cleaner than the previous model. Plus, if I need to do some service, you were saying that it's going to be easy to pull this apart. So the Y pipe, we purposely put a slip fit and we'll put a clamp in yeah. so that each of the two segments can be pulled out on their own, get the transmission out, the transfer case, or whatever, whatever you want to do. But we want to make sure we build in not only performance functionality, but service and maintenance as well. Well, Project Prickly Pear requires a lot of maintenance. So <laughs> yeah. I imagine this will probably have to come apart more than once. <laughs> so we got you covered. Thanks. After a couple more hours of test fitting to get everything to clear the suspension and the frame and get the exhaust tip to come out at the right angle, it was finally completed. And wow, what a transformation. This looks a thousand times cleaner than what was in here before. And I've gained some ground clearance now for when we're off-road. And this exhaust tip just looks so beautiful. Not to mention, there should be some noticeable performance gains with this free-flowing exhaust. Okay, you guys ready to hear what it sounds like? I was smiling from ear to ear all the way home on my drive with the sound of that exhaust. Not only is Project Prickly Pear running great, but now it sounds awesome. It's been a tough two years with this Jeep, and I think the hard work and weight is finally starting to pay off. The next time you see this Jeep, we will be out on the trail. Thanks for watching.